staying for the dinner? Oh, no. Okay. By the way, well, you probably want to start. But the woman in, in the pink jacket just yeah. picked her brain about you. She wanted to know all about your education. Ooh. Now, did I lie? Did you, your pick, discover the largest wine press in Israel? Second largest. Second largest. Okay. <laughs> You have to correct her on that. I will. Doesn't read my uh, posterior. Uh, not trying. We hope not. Yeah, it sounds. You can hear it now. Okay. Oh. If you've got your schnecks and your coffee, we will begin. I know it's awfully hard to. Rush. There was one handout today, and it is more or less a visual of chapters two and seven. Uh, when I say visual, the ancient people had their version of um, cartoons. And just like, uh, I don't know about you, but when I see a very good cartoon, I really study it because it's subtle. It has an awful lot of meaning packed into just a small space. Well, that's the way it was for uh, these wise men of Babylon, of whom Daniel now had worked his way up to being the number one guy. Uh, Behind him were his three friends. And uh, now it's very strange. We have, it says uh, chapter 2, and then we will go to chapter 7. Because if you remember the outline, the section of Daniel that deals with this world, and Daniel had front row seats and what was going on in the world of the sixth century before Christ in the Middle East. Here in Wisconsin, we probably had Indians, but we have no history. <laughs> because most of the history of the world was still in the old world. These two chapters, two and seven, are different. And yet you're gonna see that the cartoons in each one really amount to the same message and the same thoughts. And that's how you should read Daniel. You should put these things together. And remember, in the Hebrew tradition, if you repeat something, that's like an exclamation point. Pay attention. This is good stuff. That's the way they thought. So there we have the statue and the stone, chapter 2. And you'll notice that the uh, arrows that connect it, chapter 7 with the four beasts. And that's what you have in the handout. Um, you can recognize the beast, sort of, and you can recognize the image of a man. And that's what these chapters will use as cartoons. Now, when it talks about the second year of King Nebuchadnezzar, um, we're talking about the very beginning of his uh, rather lengthy and significant reign. 
For the Jewish people, Nebuchadnezzar is significant because he destroyed the temple and he flattened Jerusalem and he ripped Daniel out of his ancestral home. Daniel had no choice. He and his friends had been put into the academy in Babylon where they were to learn all the good stuff that the Babylonians thought were important. Daniel, just like anyone who goes to university today, had to sort through things. Is this really important or is it because people say it's important? And Daniel is a good example from the Bible of someone who had the God-given capability of sorting through the wisdom of this world so that even though he learned an awful lot of stuff that was worthless, at the very core, he was a child of God. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the king had a dream. This is going to be different than chapter 7. There, it's going to be Daniel having a dream. And it's going to be towards the close of Daniel's life. What it tells us that he had the same things on his mind that were brought up when he was maybe a 16-year-old kid at this time. Um, I don't know. You spend time... Uh, trying to figure out what your dreams mean? Are, no? Not really, huh? No. Oh, some people don't dream at all. I dream all the time. And then in the morning I try to figure out what, what, what was that about? Sometimes, sometimes I just can't remember very well. Anyway, the king said, all right, so what does the king do when he gets a dream and it troubles him? He gets all his wise guys together. And that, those are the graduates of that school that Daniel and his friends had attended. And notice they are described here as magicians. Uh, the word magic actually comes from Babylonian. Uh, I think we all know if you go into a magic show uh, it's the art of illusion, where you think you saw something and it's something different. Well, there was a whole school of people in Babylon who said, really, reality isn't reality. Everything, there's something real behind the reality. And it's up to us, the magicians, to tell you what the re reality behind the reality is. So we got those guys in, soothsayers. Well, these are the mumbo-jumbo guys who, um, by saying the right incantation or the right formula, were able, so they thought, to affect the, the affairs of men. And uh, you get the feeling that Nebuchadnezzar was a little bit too smart for them. Uh, uh, he counted it as so much foolishness. That didn't mean he knew the right answer. But he was attracted to Daniel. Ah, uh, the sorcerers. Well, we all had, um, what's her name? Rowling and Harry Potter. Wasn't one of the books the Sorcerer's Stone? All right, well, and if you know, uh, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. It's like the place that, like, Daniel went to, uh, what's the name of their school? Hogwarts? Hogwarts. Yeah, where you learn all kinds of spells and incantations and who knows what, and it's a great romp and it's fun and I watched it and it's not going to hurt your kids any. But make sure that they know the good stuff and are able to sort the good stuff from uh, fiction. Oh, and then another category is they call the Chaldeans. Um, the Chaldeans were a people group from which Nebuchadnezzar arose. His family was Chaldean. They lived in southern Mesopotamia. And as opposed to, for example, the Assyrians, they were a different people group. And the Chaldeans um, have given us some things that we use today. 
How many seconds are there in a minute? 60. How many minutes in an hour? 60. Uh, you mathematicians, you know that you can calculate things in different base systems. I spent a lot of time in my teenage years with a base 12 system that I developed because I, I was tired of trying to divide 10 by 3 and getting 3.3333333333 ad nauseum. If you have a base 12, you've got, you can divide it into thirds, you can divide it into sixths, you can divide it into halves. All right. Well, this whole business of 60, 60 was the base number for the Babylonian system. And the reason we count seconds and minutes that way goes all the way back to the Babylonians. So you probably uh, can, can bet that uh, Daniel got that in uh, Math 101 at the University of Nebuchadnezzar. So all of these guys, um, a motley crew, there's pictures of some of them. Um, I don't think they got the good food that Daniel got. They're kind of skinny. <laughs> they came and they stood before the king, and that's what all they could do. They could stand there. We're going to find out they weren't able to do very much. The king said to them, I dreamt a dream. Yeah, okay. He could have added, and I'm king. And when I dream, the dreams have got to be taken seriously. My spirit was troubled to understand the dream. So he admits that he really, you know, it was one of those where you wake up and you say, you know, that was kind of unsettling, but I don't remember exactly what I dreamed. The Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, yeah, here, we're in this chapters of Daniel that are written in the Aramaic language. And if you remember, Aramaic was the universal language, the language of uh, diplomacy and um, records and stuff like that. Uh, is it close to Hebrew? Yeah, if you can see on that side, even if you don't know any Hebrew, you could say, oh, that's Hebrew. No, it's Aramaic. All right, written in the same alphabet. We're, we're getting used to that if you watch the Ukraine saga. Uh, do you notice that they have a different alphabet in uh, the Soviet Union, former Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, those countries? The Cyrillic alphabet. And um, I'll just throw this in. When my wife and I lived in Kiev, we would like, to, after church on Sunday, we'd like to go to a restaurant. Only spelled in Cyrillic letters, it's spelled pectopa. So we said to each other, let's go see the pectopa. Oh, no, that's restaurant. <laughs> you could read it if you knew the alphabet. Your majesty, may you live forever. Well, that's kind of safe. You've got to say that to the big guy. And... Uh, I think they still say that to the Queen of England, don't they? She ain't going to live forever. But she has lived a long time. And so it's something that you wish your monarch. Tell the dream to your servants and we will explain its meaning. So this is the kind of, you might say, standard operating procedure. You tell us the dream, we'll tell you what it means going to be one problem, however. The king couldn't remember the dream. So he's going to make this request of these specialists. No, you tell me the dream and you interpret it for me. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the matter for me is certain. If you do not make to me uh, known to me the dream and its meaning, you will be made into body parts. Now you got an insight into Nebuchadnezzar and how he uh, kept order in Babylon. Your houses will be made a pile of rubble. If you've lived in the Middle East like I have, uh, it's a sad thing, but if you're on the wrong side of the political divide, you might have a bulldozer at your house at any time. And the way they enforce the law is to simply bulldoze down your house. Um, 
not, not well, it'd be pretty serious for all of us. However, if you reveal the dream and its meaning, you will receive gifts of reward, great honor from me. So, you know, the extreme negative coupled with the extreme positive. And, and all these guys, look at them. Now, I realize this is not a snapshot, but I think it kind of captured. What? What, old king? What are you expecting us to do? They answered a second time and said, oh, let the king tell the dream and we will explain. The king answers and said, for sure, I know that you are buying time. Um, the more I get to know Nebuchadnezzar, the more I'm, this guy was no dummy. He figured out uh, long ago that these guys were uh, in it for the money, their bureaucracy. And uh, if you do not make the dream known to me, there's only one decree. There's only one outcome for you. You have devised a lying and corrupt response to say before me, and the time changes. Therefore, reveal to me the dream, and I will know that you are able to reveal to me its meaning. If you guys are really graduates of my uh, Hogwarts, this shouldn't be terribly different, difficult for you. For the king, this was very logical. I'm off with their heads or lots of goodies. That's your choice. The Chaldeans answered the king saying, there's no person on earth who's able to relieve the king's matters. Since no great and powerful king has ever requested a matter like this from any magician, soothsayer, or Chaldean. Well, that's a little over the top. Uh, it's not the first time that this happened in the ancient world. But as far as they were concerned, with life and death in the, in the, being in the balance, that's, what else could they say? The matter that the king requests is difficult. Well, how about you? What would you say? Impossible. Um, there's no one else who can reveal it to the king except, well, there we got. And, and that's the, uh, the Hebrew word Elohe, gods. Uh, these are the spiritual forces in heaven. The Babylonians believed in them. They had lots of different ones. Uh, Daniel, however, was a disciple of the one true God. And uh, so now we're going into the spiritual realm. And uh, the gods, according to these soothsayers, their dwelling is not with mortal flesh. So I can't go over to anybody's house and knock on the door and say, oh gods, tell me what the dream was so that we can interpret it and save our skin. Uh, they're really in a pickle. Because of this, the king became very angry. He gave the order to destroy the wise men of Babylon all right, this is typical ancient um, power. And Nebuchadnezzar had absolute power. He gave the order to destroy all the graduates of his uh, Hogwarts, the whole kit and caboodle, including, of course, whom? Daniel. Daniel and his three friends. The decree was issued. It was actually uh, promulgated and proclaimed. And the wise men uh, were in the process of being executed. So they had begun enforcing this, and some of the people had lost their heads. So they sought Daniel and his companions to execute them. So Daniel was on the prescripted list. He was scheduled to die along with them. This chapter uh, underscores one of the major themes of the book of Daniel. In this world, a Christian is never that far away from death. And you say, well, it's not been my experience. Well, you've had the fortune of living in Wauwatosa. Um, what if you lived in Beresnehuvate? That's a real place in Ukraine. I don't think you would say it's, you know, 
if Putin says, off with your head, he meant, he'd mean it. And he would try to have his henchmen do it. So anyway, the decree was issued. The wise men were in the process. They sought Daniel. There he is, the executor. And the way they would execute people in those days was on a chopping block. You put your head in that, that little niche. And uh, then the uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger would pick up the uh, axe, and, and that was it. The French Revolution uh, made that same process very mechanized. And you've all heard of the guillotine, same idea. Daniel and, uh, replied, and, and of course, Daniel, he didn't panic. He went to Arioc, the chief of the king's executioners, who were, about, who were going about this execution. He said to Arioc, why is the decree so harsh from the king? So Arioc laid it all out for Daniel so he could understand. Then Daniel entered the court and requested from the king that he would give him time so that he could reveal the meaning to the king. Um, this wouldn't be a request that would be automatically granted. Daniel showed a lot of courage here to go into the presence of the king and you might say stick his nose into this business. I mean, it makes sense to us because Daniel's head was on the line too. But the king, uh, he would not have thought that way. Now what Daniel did, and this is interesting, very interesting, he gathered those believers that had escaped the destruction of Jerusalem, had gone to school with him, so that together they would pray to God and ask for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that they, not, so they wouldn't lose their heads with all the wise men in Babylon. Now it's kind of interesting. Daniel is typical of believers who, of course, Daniel would have thought of himself and his friends, but immediately he was thinking about everybody. The king was being arbitrary. The king was being, uh, well, he was following his own uh, philosophy and his own approach to life. Uh, Daniel understood that. But Daniel stuck his nose into this business because I suppose he'd say this isn't fair. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision at night. So the king had the dream. The king could not understand the dream. He was desperate to find out what it meant. And all the people that were supposed qualified to know mysteries and things like that, they had come up empty, except Daniel. Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Well, I guess if God gave you a an answer for which you had prayed earnestly, you would certainly uh, thank God when he gave the answer. Daniel said, may the name of God be blessed forever and ever because wisdom and power are his. This is a theme in Daniel. Daniel is always giving credit to the God of Israel. When he has a chance, I mean, come on, in this world, when you got the edge, when you got a secret, <laughs> you try to monetize it, right? You try to get an edge. You try to get a little extra money in your pocket. Daniel's made of different stuff. The God of heaven changes times and eras. He deposes kings and establishes kings. So you see, Daniel already had an inkling what this was going to be about. He gives wisdom to wise people and knowledge to those who know discernment. He reveals deep things and hidden things. He knows what is in the dark and, he, and, and the light dwells with him. So God, God is not shrouded in darkness and confusion. He lives in the light. Daniel acknowledged all of that. To you, God of my ancestors, I give thanks and praise. You have given me wisdom and power. 
Now, you have made known to me what, you, what we requested because you have, made to a, you have made known to us not only Daniel, but his three friends, the king's matter. And as a result of all of this, Daniel went to, into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men. He went and said, now hold it up. Don't destroy everybody. Bring me before the king, and I will explain this dream. Then Arioch immediately brought Daniel before the king. This is what he said. I have found, now just contrast this to Daniel. See, there's an intermediary. Somebody else has to go and plead the thing. I have found a man. Really? I think Daniel came to him. But he's going to try to take uh, advantage of this. And this is what he said. I have found a man from the exiles of Judah who will make known the meaning. Well, Arioch had known uh, Daniel. And he probably had pretty good confidence that Daniel knew what he was talking about. The king said to Daniel, by the way, uh, you, know, you go before the king, you don't use your Hebrew name, you use your Aramaic name, Belteshazzar. Are you able to make known to me the meaning of the dream that I saw and its meaning? No, make known to me the dream and, uh, that I saw and its meaning. Daniel answered before the king, the mystery that the king is asking, no wise man, soothsayer, magician, or diviner is able to reveal revealed to the king. So let's just rule this out. Where you have turned for your answers is a dead end. All those guys that you paid for at your Hogwarts Academy, they, it's, it's a foregone conclusion. They couldn't come up with the answer. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar Here's the uh, general theme. What will happen in the latter days? So this is a peek behind the curtain of history. What's going to happen? You, your majesty, your thoughts upon your bed are aroused about what will be after this, and the revealer of mysteries made known to you what will happen. So here's, here's the context. Daniel's basically saying, God gave you a dream that will lay out the immediate future of you, your kingdom, and what comes after. Now, we're in that section of Daniel where we're talking about the affairs of this world. And the affairs of this world were not very good to the Jewish people. They had lost their kingdom, they had lost their king, they had lost their temple, and they had lost the brightest and the best like Daniel and his three friends. Uh, from a world's point of view, they were in a world of hurt. But God was still in control. And he was going to use this to impress Nebuchadnezzar. I'm going to stop just for a second. In, in my studies of the book of Daniel, I have come to the personal conclusion, it's not from God, but I would not be surprised at all, at all if I met Nebuchadnezzar in heaven someday. I think the testimony of Daniel was so powerful, not just, it begins here, but it goes throughout the book that uh, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged the one true God, and we don't know an awful lot about uh, the ancient people. But we shouldn't um, rule out the fact that there were people touched by the testimony of the Jewish people. Uh, there's another book in the Old Testament called Esther. You ever hear of it? Yeah. Foxy Lady. I mean, if you, you get yourself in a position where you can marry the most powerful man in the world. Whoa! And um, she saved uh, the Jewish people from uh, uh, a madman who was going to wipe them all out would have been uh, an ancient version of the Holocaust. 
And to this day, the Jewish people celebrate it at the festival of Purim, which comes January, February every year. All right, you, your majesty, your thoughts upon your bed arose about what will be after this, and the revealer of mysteries made known. But as for me, this mystery was not revealed to me because of wisdom that is in me more than in any other living beings. So I'm not going to put make myself better than the soothsayers and all the other graduates of Hogwarts Academy. Uh, there's only going to be one source from which this saving message, remember, it's going to save people's lives. They had already begun to chop off heads. It was revealed to me so that the meaning may be made known to your majesty and so that you may know the thoughts of your heart. You, your majesty, were looking and what you saw was a very large statue. That statue, large, bright, extraordinary, was standing before you and it was like a cartoon but it scared the bejeebers out of you. Now maybe you say, well, statue. What's scary about that? Well, got Daniel's testimony. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was panicking because it was scary. And he didn't know what it meant. And he couldn't even remember that he had seen it. That, by the way, uh, that's not an S on him. That's not Superman. I just comment on the picture. The statue, its head was of fine gold. Its chest and its arms were made out of silver. Its abdomen and thighs were of bronze. Its shins were of iron. And its feet were partly of iron and partly of clay. Uh, the expression that you have feet of clay comes from Daniel. It's, that image is borrowed from the Bible. You continued to look until a stone was cut. Was cut, doesn't say by whom. Not by the king. The stone struck the statue on its feet that were of iron and clay, and it smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed simultaneously. And all of the bitty pieces flew away like chaff in the wind. The wind lifted them and no place could be found for them. Do you get the picture? There's this, this huge being made of a de descending order of precious metals. Gold, the most precious. Clay, the least worthy. And this is what the king saw. However, the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the entire earth. That sounds like a dream. Uh, you recognize the peak? Anybody? Yeah, somebody said it. Matterhorn. And uh, through the magic of uh, PowerPoint, you can, you can do that. You can make it little, little and then make it big. And the idea is that it filled the whole world. This is the dream. So we will tell its meaning before your majesty. You, your majesty, you are in our time in Babylon, the king of kings, to whom God in heaven has given kingdom, power, strength, and glory. There's a message here. This is a prophet of God talking to the man who thinks that he um, is numero uno in the whole wide world. In all the places where the sons of man, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the sky dwell, he has given them into your hand, and he has made you ruler over them. Well, we'd say, how many people were uh, living in the world at this time? That's a very interesting study. Uh, the 
time of the Roman Empire, which was about six centuries later, they said about 10 million people lived on the whole world. And at the time of Babylon, uh, maybe five million. Well, yes, yeah, a lot of people. But really, in the whole wide world, five million ain't much. Today, what do we got? Six, seven billion people? Daniel lays it right out. You, Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold in your dream. After you, another kingdom will arise that is inferior to you, as silver is inferior to gold. Then another, a third kingdom, will arise that is of bronze, which is inferior to silver and gold. But it will rule the entire world. A fourth kingdom will be strong as iron, since iron crushes and shatters everything. So like iron that smashes, it will crush and smash all of these. So we're talking here about a sequence of world powers, one after the other. Babylon, and then two more, and then one that is going to uh, crush all of the predecessors, be rather ruthless. Because you saw feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, this last kingdom will be divided. In other words, it'll have many ethnic groups and um, political factions. It will have some of the firmness of iron because you saw iron mixed with common clay. Moreover, the toes of the feet were partly iron, partly clay, meaning that part of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. Well, we're talking about the kingdom that was there when the Lord Jesus appeared in the world. And uh, here we get to the uh, nub of this dream, the, uh, you might say, the good news. There's a stone that was cut out. Doesn't say by whom. What did it do to this whole image? By hitting it in the feet? Made it into trash that was blown away by the wind. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will establish a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will the kingdom be left to another people. It will crush and end all of these kingdoms, but it will be established forever. What was Jesus' message to the Jewish people when he went around Galilee and Judea? The kingdom of God is, the kingdom of God is nigh, near, it's here. He also predicted that Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed. Sure, that's also part of history. But the one that will smash all the worldly powers and will stand forever is the kingdom of our God. And if you think of the book of Revelation and the kingdom of his Christ. Uh, you know that uh, flourish in Handel's Messiah? And he will reign forever and ever and ever and ever. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm not, don't, don't try to imitate my singing. <laughs> and then we have hallelujah, amen. Uh, I, I, I listen to Handel's Messiah often because it, to me it's just so, so old and New Testament all rolled into one. And, uh, the irony, the crowning irony, is that Handel wasn't a believer. He wrote it uh, to make some money. Ah, did I disillusion you? That happens. Just as you saw that the mountain, a stone was cut, but not by human hands, and it crushed the image the great God has made known to your majesty, what will happen after this? So after this would be the sixth century before Christ, the time of King Nebuchadnezzar. The dream is sure and the meaning is certain. So you can see Daniel looking right square in the eyes of the king and saying, this isn't BS. This is it. There will be a series of kingdoms, each inferior to the last, and finally, 
There will be a stone that will obliterate them all and it will fill the whole earth, the kingdom of our God and the rule of his Christ. Yes, sir. I know there's probably a lot of speculation here, but have scholars looked back on this? Do, have they ascribed um, the other metals versus the, the reigns or um, other power, world powers? Have these? Well, hold on, you'll see that Daniel interprets okay. for us. Okay. And the rest of the book, uh, there are other cartoons that we, uh, we all right, let, let's not play around. There's Babylonia, then there's the Persian Empire, then there's the Greek Empire uh, established by uh, Alexander. Alexander the Great, and then finally it's the Roman Empire. And what happens, well, back in the book of Genesis, it says, the, the scepter will not depart from Judah until he comes to whom it belongs, and to him the obedience of the nations. All right, when did the scepter depart from Judah? In the days of Herod the Great. And who was born during his reign? And who died and rose again and established his kingdom and had his 12 apostles go out into all the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ? And it's still there. Not always in the same shape, and I can say that because um, I think we've, we've kind of touched on our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. They have a different letter, liturgy than we do. And they celebrate Easter a week later than we do. <laughs> Never mind. It's all part of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of his Christ. First uh, Peter chapter 2 identifies this stone not cut by human hands, the living stone. I, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. All right, here, here we have, in the book of Daniel, an outline of world history that has been fulfilled and is being fulfilled. Uh, this summer at uh, Mequon, there will be a world mission gathering, and there will be people from, I, I don't know, a dozen, 20 plus different countries, some black, some uh, brown, some, I hate the Chinese people aren't yellow. But that, that's the uh, cartoon that we work with. But people, people from every tribe, and, and, and the book of Revelation says, what did I see before the throne? Who came out of the great rebellion? Who came out of the time of tribulation? It was people from every nation, tribe, language, and tongue. And that's true. It's happening. It happens around us. And he calls upon us to be part of that multitude. Oh. Just as you saw the, the, a stone that was not cut by human hands, the great God has made known to your majesty what will happen. The dream is sure. I think I had this slide already, yes. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell down and paid homage to Daniel. Well, that's typical. Uh, <laughs> what would you call this, 180? Was one moment he was cutting people's heads off, and now he falls down. I, I know that the king was relieved right down to the core of his being, that this troublesome dream, you know, he knew Daniel had nailed it. And now he had insight into what God was trying to communicate to him, that the powers of this world are transitory, not like inflation. <laughs> Excuse me, I can't resist. But the things that trouble us in life are transitory. What stands and endures forever is the word of our God and the word made flesh is none other than 
the stone not made by human hands. The, uh, we, we say it in our creed every Sunday, born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit. It's the miracle of the incarnation. And uh, I mean, we just went through it. He was born, he preached, he gathered disciples, he died, he rose again. He sent out the 12, and the 12 became the 3,000, and the 3,000 became the 5,000, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then the king promoted Daniel to a high position, gave him many gifts, made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon. That's like being the ruler of Washington, D.C. I know, but it was almost that bad, but at least Daniel was the ruler. Uh, the chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Oh yeah, all these smart guys who just got their, their lives saved. Daniel became uh, their official bureaucratic leader. Daniel sought from the king and he appointed over the service of the province of Babylon the other guys. Daniel, boy, you know, this is so contrary to this world. When you're the wolf of Wall Street, you got all this money. Do you like to share it with everybody? That's not the way the world works. But Daniel was a child of God. He did not forget his friends when he had achieved this uh, success. All right, now that's, uh, oh boy, I know when we have Holy Communion Sunday, you, your uh, time is constricted, but we'll see how much we can get done in 10 minutes. Chapter seven, you've got the cartoon. It's, it's the same story, different imagery. The four beasts. In the first year of King Belshazzar of Babylon, now uh, this moves uh, the clock ahead. Uh, Daniel is no longer a kid. He's now uh, a senior citizen. And uh, Daniel saw a dream. He wrote, he wrote down the dream, at least the main things. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision. Four winds of heaven were churning the great sea. Um, imagery becomes very interesting when you study the Bible. Imagery isn't a real thing, but it points to the reality behind it. When you come across the sea, in the book of Revelation, in the book of Daniel, and in other places. This is the tumultuous sea of, we call it the sea of humanity. Uh, so what Daniel saw coming from the creatures of this world, uh, the existence of people, uh, the sea was churning, and four large beasts were coming up from the sea, each one different from the others. This is not a man made out of different precious metals. Now notice if you look at your picture, they're different than the beasts that they represent because they all got wings. And uh, wings simply indicate that they can flit around and they can be everywhere. It's just like Twitter. The first one was a lion that had the wings of an eagle. And the wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and was made to stand on its feet like a man, and a man's mind was given to it. Uh, we're gonna see that the, the lion with the wings is the Babylonian Empire and Nebuchadnezzar's family. Another second beast resembled a bear, and on one side it was raised up, so the bear was not lying, it was, it was lying so that one side of it was raised up, and three ribs were in its mouth. It had been eating flesh, and this is a picture of the, uh, the, the Persian Empire, and before it, the Median, who had conquered uh, three kingdoms to replace Babylon. We're gonna to get to the fall of the Babylonian Empire, and Daniel becoming uh, prime minister among the Persians. That's part of the book of Daniel. But you notice that this, this guy's got wings.
Yep, batteries. Oh, well, nice. Okay, we'll take this off. Yeah, whenever you deal with the, um, the, the Greek Empire, you've got uh, one leper that runs like crazy all over the world. His name is Alexander the Great. He will come again in Babylon chapter 11, in da Daniel chapter 11. And uh, when he dies, his kingdom is divided among four generals, Egypt, uh, Syria, and tw uh, one of them in Asia Minor and one of them in Greece. Eventually, they uh, reduced two, and that's part of the history of the world between uh, the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire. And so this beast had four heads, and it had wings, and it, it, it kind of go, went all over the place. Uh, it's a good description because uh, when, when Alexander went out into the world and conquered, he not only uh, spread political power, but he spread the uh, wisdom of Plato and Aristotle and the Greek philosophers and uh, Greek religion too, to the point that we're going to find out Zeus, the great god of the Greeks, uh, was worshipped in Jerusalem by having not a, a little lamb that was slain, but a pig sacrificed on the altar of the temple. Uh, also part of the story that's coming. Okay. All right. Now, the, <laughs> the fourth piece is an interesting one. Um, it's sort of like a triceratops, if you are into dinosaurs. Lots of horns. And then at the bottom you'll see that in the middle of all the horns was a horn that had a human face and it was always talking. Uh, this is a dream. But this fourth beast is equivalent of the Roman Empire and what would come out of it to challenge uh, the message of the gospel in the time of the apostles. I was considering the horns. Another horn, a little one, came up. Three previous horns were uprooted in front of it. Behold, the eyes were like human eyes. The horn had a mouth speaking great things. Great things, but lies. So this is worldly power gone amok and comes out of the most uh, hard to picture beast of the four. I continue to look upon the thrones. Boy, I think I would stare at them too. And the Ancient of Days was seated. That's the first time this title has appeared in the Bible. But just think about it, Ancient of Days. Who do you think Daniel's talking about? God himself the one who has been from eternity to eternity. His clothes were white as snow and his hair and his head was like pure wool. That same picture comes up in the book of Revelation. His throne was flames of fire, river of fire flowed and came out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended to him. Ten thousands upon ten thousands stood before him and the books were opened. Those books, remember, books, there were no books at this time. The scrolls were open. I kept looking, and because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, I kept looking until the beast was killed and its body was destroyed and was given into burning fire. Oh, if you know the book of Revelation, you see crossovers here from Daniel. Same picture. Uh, this is those who are in the place of Christ. Greek word for in place of is anti. And uh, we have the word antichrist. It doesn't mean, well, it, he is against Christ, but really the true meaning of the word is in place of Christ. For any, any belief system or lying human voice that contradicts the gospel of Jesus Christ is this uh, 
Jesus. I kept looking and on the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man. Son of Man is a Hebrew term, Ben Adam. And it seems to mean fully human. We just had the uh, Nicene Creed in church. Uh, ben Adam. Who is Ben Adam? Same as the one who is the Son of God. This is part, part of the heart of our faith. He came with the Ancient of Days, and he was brought before him. To him was given dominion, honor, and kingdom. Peoples, nations, languages will worship him. His dominion is an eternal dominion. All right, so we had a stone smashing the statue, and it filled the whole world. Here we have a vision after you have the lying uh, horn speaking blasphemies of the Ancient of Days, God himself, and what comes with him is the Son of Man. Jesus referred to this when he was on trial. He said to the high priest, I saw the Son of Man coming on clouds of... He's quoting from Daniel. I, Daniel, my spirit was distressed within my body, and the visions of my head disturbed me. I think if I had such a dream, I'd be a little unsettled too. I approached one of those standing there and I asked him the truth about this. So he spoke to me and made known the meaning of the words. And uh, Gabriel, we know him as an angel <coughs> who had appeared to the Virgin Mary and appeared to uh, Zechariah in the temple. And Gabriel also appears in the book of Daniel an angel from God who came to explain to human beings like you and me what this is all about. These great beasts that are four are four kings who will rise from the earth, but the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom, and they will possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. Do you see the parallel between the first cartoon, the statue, and now the one of the four beasts? It comes to the same conclusion, the same end. I desired to be certain about the fourth beast. That was different from all of them. It was very frightening. Its teeth were of iron. All right, there, we got that guy. And I desired to be certain about the ten horns on its head and the other horn that came up, and uh, the horn had eyes and a mouth speaking great things, and the appearance was greater than its companions. We aren't going to have time today to, to venture into this. But suffice it to say, uh, Daniel here is giving a preview of world history that will culminate against the forces of this world. Remember, we're in the part of Daniel talking about the threats from this world. And there will be a lot of horns in biblical imagery, a horn is a powerful thing. It has power. <coughs> and uh, if you think about what are the horns that are talking blasphemous lies about God and his Christ today, Marxism, pardon? Our, <laughs> our government. Oh, our government. Well, our government is definitely influenced by the things that this world is doing, as it always has been. Any ism that is not rooted in the grace and love of God for his people is futile. That's why Daniel ends up being, above all, a, a um, scroll of hope, for, especially for kids. Which kid doesn't know about Daniel in the lion's den? That comes next week. And who doesn't know the four men in the fiery furnace? Three men and, and one who is like the son of God. Come back next week and we will take it further. Don't want you to be late for church. <laughs>